masking and stuff on me. So, all right, thanks for that. So now, youth, if you guys want to get out, you can uh, get out in Jesus' name. And what you do, do quickly. So, so we're going to be in, uh, somebody got that. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 3 today. We're actually going to finish up the rest of the, uh, the chapter this morning. So turn to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to jump in at verse uh, 14. And, you know, we looked last week at what we said was the best church of the seven churches. It was the church at Philadelphia, right, often called the faithful church. We saw that they were faithful to the word. They were faithful to Jesus' name. They were faithful to evangelism and walking through that open door that he'd set before them. And certainly we said that this is the church that we all, as believers today, would hope to be a part of. And yet we've looked now at six churches. There's only one church left, and we're going to look at that this morning. And unfortunately, this is the church that more Christians today might actually find themselves a little bit more comfortable in. The, the church at Laodicea is often referred to, as you know, as the lukewarm church because it was filled with what Jesus called lukewarm believers. And if you read ahead or if you've studied through this letter before, you know that it is a challenging one. It would be great if we could just skip right over this and get right on to chapter 4 where we end up in the throne room of heaven. And yet this is a challenging letter and it's, it's an important letter because there are so many lessons to be learned from lukewarm Laodicea. We're going to watch Jesus speak very sharply. He's going to speak very directly. You might say he's going to pull no punches as he's going to work to try to get the attention of this distracted group of his followers. And it starts right out, as he has every time in verse 14, he's gonna give them a reminder of exactly who he is. And it's something with which this church certainly seems to have lost sight of. So in verse 14 of Revelation chapter three, he says, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So here we have the important, the very wealthy city of Laodicea. It was located, if you look on the map, just about 45 miles southwest of Philadelphia, where we were last week. It's about 90 miles due east of Ephesus. So we've completed our sort of circle of the seven churches. It was one of three cities that were kind of clustered together. They were actually within eyesight of one another. There was Laodicea, there was the city of Colossae, and then there was the city of Hierapolis. Now, the city of Laodicea was situated right on the river Lycus. And as a result, it controlled the commerce that passed all along that river from the entire inland portion of Asia Minor, or Turkey today, from there all the way to the seacoast. It was also situated right at the junction of three great roads that crossed ancient Asia Minor, and so it controlled a tremendous amount of the trade that passed through all of the ancient world. And so very naturally, it became a great commercial as well as a financial and ultimately a banking center. So simply because of its location, it was a center for commerce. It became an administrative center also of the Roman Empire. And the thing to understand about Laodicea is it was a very very wealthy city, and it was filled with very, very, very wealthy people. So much so, just to give you an idea, we're told according to historians that in 61 AD, one of those earthquakes that we know were prevalent in that region completely devastated the entire city. And the government of Rome then came to the city and offered to pay for the rebuilding of the city, and yet the leaders of Laodicea, they basically turned away all of the federal disaster relief. They said, we don't need your federal funds, and instead they rebuilt the city completely out of their own resources, demonstrating in that that they needed no help from nobody, right? 
So very independent, very wealthy city. Religiously, it was another one of these cities of the ancient world that had a significant Jewish population. And like the other cities in the region, it was a center for Caesar worship and the worship of the healing god Asclepios. Now, it also, of course, had this Christian community. And we think it could, could possibly have been founded by Epaphras, who was one of Paul's faithful traveling companions, as we saw in Acts. And yet we see that the church here in the city at Laodicea is mentioned by Paul when he writes to the Colossians. And the words that he has to say sort of paint them in kind of an unfavorable light. And as we move ahead, we're going to see that Jesus as well offers no approval of them. This is one of only two churches, together with self-sufficient Sardis, this is one of only two churches that Jesus had nothing to approve, but only offers his accusation against them. Look at verse 15. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Now, this is a simple yet sort of a strange kind of an accusation, right, as a characterization that Jesus makes of this church. He basically declares this entire group of Laodicean believers to be, as he'll put it in the next verse, to be lukewarm, spiritually speaking. Now, we know in a physical sense, of course, lukewarmness is simply something that is kind of what? It's kind of room temperature. It's something that has cooled down to the level of everything else, the environment around it. It's just like everything around it. So spiritual lukewarmness, Jesus describes here as being neither cold toward God, but also not being hot toward him, not being on fire, not being zealous for the Lord. It's just kind of to be in that place of indifference. So it's to go to church. It's to acknowledge that God exists. It's to acknowledge certain things related to him. But when my heart toward him and my attitude toward him is one of kind of a, a very passive kind of an indifference about him. There's no rejection of him. There's no hostility towards him. There's not a coldness, but there's also no zeal. And this is a very scary place to be. And perhaps the, maybe it's even the scariest place to be because notice Jesus here says something kind of astonishing. He says that he would rather that they would be cold toward him than lukewarm about him. Now we could understand, of course, if he said that he wanted them to be hot or, you know, zestos for him, but to be cold? And so what's interesting is that Jesus viewed this spiritual condition of lukewarmness as being more dangerous in a person's life than even being cold toward God. Because it, there is more hope of getting someone who is outright hostile toward God there's more hope of getting them to repent toward God the way that Paul did, remember, on the road to Damascus, than there is of getting a lukewarm person out of their lukewarmness and getting them to get right with God. And maybe you've had that kind of an experience with a lukewarm person. They are the hardest people in the world to deal with and to minister to because they're indifferent, because they're just complacent because they have this false sense of their own security. There's this kind of feeling that, hey, as long as I'm not hostile toward God, as long as I'm not cold towards God, then that's probably satisfactory with God, right? And then they just sort of justify that they can live their lives any old way that they want to. But notice next, Jesus is going to say something very different. He has something specifically that he's going to say now to wake them up to the reality of this very dangerous spiritual condition. In verse 16, he says, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Wow. Now, Jesus has a way, doesn't he, of saying something when he wants to. <laughs> 
He leaves no question where he stands. And most simply, in the simplest way we can say it, Jesus is saying that their lukewarm condition makes him sick. It makes him sick to his stomach. It makes him sick at his core, so much so that he is going to vomit them out of his mouth. It is one of the strongest, one of the most shocking statements made by Jesus in the entire Bible. And certainly, it sends a very clear message, doesn't it? And it paints what is both a powerful as well as kind of a painful picture, right? Jesus vomiting, right? Now, don't worry, there's not a picture. I don't have a picture of that for you this morning, right? But what does it mean to vomit something out of our mouth? Couldn't Jesus just as easily said, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth? But he doesn't. He says, vomit. And I'm so sorry to have to do this on a Sunday morning, right? But vomiting, as we all know, it is the violent expulsion from a body of something that is making that body sick. Something that is dangerous to the the health and the well-being of that body, right? And vomiting, of course, is not very pleasant, to say the least. And yet it would have certainly gotten the attention of the Laodiceans because in spite of their great wealth, their city had a terrible supply of fresh drinking water. In the spring, in the winter, pardon me, in the early spring, Right, the river that they were situated on supplied them with good water. But then very quickly, starting in the mid-spring and then all the way through the long, hot summer, the river would dry up and leave Laodicea lacking in any water supply at all. And yet here we have Colossae, right, just a stone's throw away. They had this beautiful sort of cold spring water as their water source. And yet a little bit closer in Hierapolis, which was just across the river. They had a water source too, but it was hot spring water that came up from these underground sort of mineral sulfur hot springs, which is great if you need a nice soak, but maybe not so great if you need something to drink. And when the water would get scarce, the Laodiceans would import their water, not from Colossae, but from Hierapolis because it was considerably closer, it was a little bit uphill from them, which was important because the water would come to them by the way of this aqueduct which they had constructed. And so by the time it arrived there into the city of Laodicea, what had started out hot was now very lukewarm. And it had also picked up, it had been tainted, it had been polluted by whatever it had accumulated along the way in the aqueduct. So now their drinking water, by the time it got to the city, it had the double distinction, not only of tasting like lukewarm sulfur, but also making people sick all summer long as they drank it, even to the point of vomiting. So this is not a pleasant scenario. And what Jesus is talking about here is not pleasant for him, because he does not want to come to a church like this. And yet there is something about this church. There's something about this kind of Christian that really is a danger to the body of Christ as a whole. And it's worth whatever it takes in the process to get corrected, right, for the health of the larger whole. So this general attitude kind of of lukewarmness, it makes Jesus sick. He recognizes that it's a danger to the whole body. And we can be here on a Sunday morning and we can read about this kind of lukewarmness. or We can hear about this kind of lukewarmness. And the first thing we say is, well, I know just this kind of church, right? It's down the road a few blocks. Or we can say, hey, I know a guy who's just like that. And what happens is that we never really let it kind of come close to us. But do this with me really quick. What would you say hot is? Like on a scale of 1 to 10. Maybe hot's like 8 to 10 probably. What's cold then? So cold would probably be 3, 2, 1. Those would be cold. So then what's lukewarm? Probably 4, 5, 6 maybe even up into seven, somewhere in there would be lukewarm. 
And if a person finds themselves in that four, five, six kind of a place in terms of my zeal and my fervor for the Lord, then that probably constitutes lukewarmness. So where are we actually? Where are you actually at? Are you in that eight to 10 kind of a range? And I think that to pause and consider this kind of helps the letter get just a little bit closer to us, doesn't it? And we think, well, you know, four, five, six, maybe even seven. Hey, that's a C, right? I'm doing okay. That's average. And yet one of the points I think that Jesus is making here is that from the vantage point of heaven, right, far away from the very skewed perspective that we get here in this world, but from the vantage point of heaven, it is inconceivable to heaven that sinful man redeemed by grace would be anything less than zealous toward God would be anything less than a 10 or a 9 or an 8. Because from the vantage point of heaven, it is an affront, it's an insult for a human being, especially one who calls themselves a Christian, ever to grow lukewarm toward the true and living God. And I know that it happens. And I'm not saying this to condemn anyone, but I'm saying it simply to adjust our skewed perspective. Because to have this potential for a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, to have that potential to be zealous for that, but then to treat it with a lukewarmness, I have to think that heaven looks at that and says, you know what, we just don't get that up here. We don't understand that. And I think we need to hear that as Christians because we can so easily become accustomed to being a four, five, or six. And we need someone to say something to kind of pull us out and to clue us in to how it is that we got there. And that's precisely what Jesus does next for Laodicea because he's going to point out their two primary problems of self-sufficiency and self-deception. Look in verse 17. He says, "'Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy,' And have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's a descriptive string of adjectives, isn't it? Right? They actually thought they were one thing, but Jesus here says that they were actually the opposite of that thing. That God knew them in the estimation of heaven, He knew them to be something else entirely. He knew them to be proud and self-satisfied, and self-deceived. Because here's a group of people that Jesus looks at them. He says that they literally make him sick, spiritually speaking, and yet they are so distracted by their wealth, and they are so lifted up in their pride, that they actually believe that they are deeply spiritual people. And Jesus says what they actually are is wretched, miserable, and poor. Poor to the point of begging is what that word poor actually means. For all of their material wealth, they were spiritually bankrupt. And they were blind to these spiritual things. They had no insight into their true condition. They didn't even know they were naked. They didn't even know that they should have been ashamed. And they considered themselves deeply spiritual. And they didn't even know that they were actually miserable. Now deep down... Don't we all know this? There is really no one who's actually more miserable than a lukewarm Christian. Because a lukewarm Christian has too much of the world to be happy in Jesus, but they have too much of Jesus to be happy any longer in the world. But the Laodiceans, they'd become content. They were puffed up in that reality of their misery. And I I mean, this church and Jesus are operating off of two entirely different definitions of spirituality. And we have to ask, how in the world does that happen? Well, it happens because they had thrown away God's marks of spiritual maturity, and they had replaced them with their own. And I don't know how anyone could read this letter and come away with any other conclusion than that this church is 
at Laodicea was absolutely biblically illiterate. Notice, notice again the contrast that Jesus points out here in this verse. He says, you say, but you do not know. And what they don't know is what anyone would have known, even if they had a cursory familiarity with the scriptures. This church had ceased, or maybe they'd never started, to look at the Bible for a proper kind of a self evaluation related to where they were spiritually. And it's so important that we all do that. It's like, I love what James says when he talks about the Bible. In James chapter 1, he says that if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. Forgets what he looks like. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now, I don't know if this is true for you, but it is true for me. That morning mirror, right, can be very faithful to show us our true physical condition, right? And sometimes it's just not so easy to look at. And yet, we do it, don't we? We do it every single day. We wouldn't leave the house without doing that. And once we do it, what happens? We get right to work, don't we? With razors and creams and soaps and combs and tweezers and ointments to fix ourselves up physically. And as honest as a physical mirror is to us about our physical condition, the Word of God provides the very same thing to us about our spiritual condition. And it is the only place that we can go to get this kind of a proper assessment. And apparently, very long ago, this church had ceased to go to the Word of God for those things. And this is why the teaching of the Word of God, right, all of the Word of God, from Genesis right to Revelation, that's why it's so important in the life of a local church, because it protects us, right? It thoroughly prepares us, but it also protects us from this very kind of self-deception, because it forces us to see who we really are, and then to address those things that we see are really important to God. And I think it's very, very important for us as Christians, especially today, as we kind of see the direction of the church we need to understand that teaching from the Bible and teaching the Bible, those are two entirely different things. Because a person can be taught for 50 years in a church from the Bible and never really learn the Bible. They know key verses all around the Bible, but they don't know the reason why Colossians was written. They don't understand why 1 John was written, why the Psalms were written. They don't know the main theme, maybe even of the book of Proverbs. So what happens is when they hit those things that are happening in their lives, and they're facing, I'm facing this huge, gigantic decision, and then I don't even know where to go in the Word of God to find wisdom. God wants us to know that you turn to the book of Proverbs for that. Or I'm in the middle of some huge difficult trial, right, as the emotions and the waves are coming in one upon the other, and I'm asking, you know, where can I go to get some perspective on all of these different highs and lows that I'm facing in life? And what I need to know is that I can turn to the Psalms for that. I can turn to the Psalms where the psalmist processes every kind of emotion that's known to man and comes through that with a good perspective with an adjusted perspective, and then the psalmist helps us to do the same thing. So God wants us as his people to have a working knowledge of the Bible, where I know what it means and I know what it says and I know where I can turn for myself to help myself in the time of need. And I know how to navigate it myself. I believe that this is how God wants us to be able to use the word of God. And yet the Laodiceans... They had no working knowledge of the scriptures, and that had led to their self-deception, which led also then 
to their self-sufficiency. Because of, instead of depending on the word of God, they started depending on their material wealth to bring them comfort and to bring them assurance, right? Their material comfort had become a cancer to their spiritual well-being. And they had allowed all of that to really dull that sense of dependence that they should have had on the Lord. Now, the contrasts here are pretty sobering, aren't they? between what they think and what they really are, or between what they see and what Jesus sees, or between all of their wealth and the affluence of their city and their own spiritual bankruptcy, that is all very sobering. And yet what is most sobering for us is that this final church at lukewarm Laodicea, it's a sobering and a terrible picture of the backslidden church of today. It represents for us the church on earth today. Historically, the lukewarm church is the church of the last days in which we are living. And Paul describes this church of the last days. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he describes it as having a form of godliness, but denying its power. So it's a church that has prestige and wealth and probably some political power and clout. And yet all the while, it's a church that's absolutely spiritually poor. It's a church of empty religion. It's a church full of empty, lukewarm Christians. And really, when you think about it, there probably has never been a greater curse upon the earth than empty religion. Because what empty religion does is it takes that inherent need we have to worship something and it replaces the self-sacrificial worship of the true and living God and it replaces it with the self-indulgent worship of self. And that's exactly what happened here with the church at Laodicea and it is exactly what is happening with so much of the Christian church today. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life or desires to use that life for selfish purposes, Jesus says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Because where selfishness will take me, And where self-ism will take me, and where Jesus will lead me, these are two entirely different places. These are two entirely different qualities of our life, because to seek self and to focus on myself is surely to miss out on God's highest and his plan for my life. And yet the church has taken the bait. We've taken the bait from the world, and we have very subtly shifted Maybe I should say they have very subtly, right? The church has very subtly shifted the entire focus from Jesus to self. And we see the way that the language of the world has taken root and made its way into the teachings of the church where now we start, we're talking from the pulpit about self-awareness and self-care and self-esteem and self-love and self-improvement and self-actualization. And what we've done is we've wrapped it all up into a couple of -of out-of-context Bible verses to make it feel a little bit more like church. And none of these things are inherently evil in and of themselves, but what is evil in and of itself is our focus when we have used the worship of God to legitimize the worship of ourselves. And when we're tuning in or we're we're showing up to hear sermons like, you know, releasing the champion inside of you or living your best life today or, you know, you can have it all in Jesus' name. And that the answer from the scriptures is not to worship the self, it's not even to improve the self, it's to crucify it, to kill it and to get it out of the way so that Jesus can then live his life through us. It's like what Paul said to the Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Laodiceans probably thought they were living their best life, right? But what we should be doing is let, letting Jesus live his best life through us. And yet that is not a very popular picture to present to people, you know, crucify the flesh and die to self. And no doubt there are some of you that are upset with me and probably aren't coming back next week. And God bless you if that's you. But so many churches, right? So many churches cave to the will and the wants of the people and they just start telling them what it is they want to hear. The name Laodicea, do you know what it means? It means the rule of the people. And it's more than just the way the church is governed. One of the language experts say its name designates it as the church of mob rule. The democratic church in, with every, in which everything is swayed and decided by popular opinion and clamor. Right? This is, the whole suggestion is a church that's no longer governed under the authority of what God says. It's not a coincidence. Did you notice in the first verse of the letter, chapter um, verse 14, did you notice the letter is written to the church of the Laodiceans? Not to the church at or in Laodicea, the way that all of the other letters are addressed. And it's interesting and it's absolutely significant because it confirms this was not the church of Jesus at Laodicea. This was the church of the Laodiceans. This was a church that was, you know, directed by and ruled by the whim and the will of the people. And it's not that these people don't like church. They do like church. They just like it the way that they like it. They liked it to be a little bit more about them and a little bit less about God. And a little bit less about God and a little bit more about me. Isn't it so prevalent today as the church becomes more and more lukewarm, it becomes more and more like everything else in the world around it, it all becomes more about me. And the problem is that the degree to which a church is man-centered or me-centered is also the degree to which it is no longer God-centered. The degree to which a church is focused on man is the degree to which it's no longer focused on God. And the degree to which man is talked about and man is exalted in the church is the degree to which God is no longer talked about and no longer exalted in that church because you can't worship them both at the same time. And Laodicea was that kind of place. And if you are in that kind of a place this morning, if you're back in that place where you have put yourself back on that throne in your life and you are ruling and you are reigning without any guidance, without any direction from the Lord, right, according to the will of the people, right? Jesus has now these following words of admonition, right? For the church at Laodicea, and he's also got them for us the lukewarm church. Look what he says in verse 18. He says, I counsel you to buy, gold, to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So here Jesus counsels these struggling believers to receive his riches from him, those true riches that they could also be rich uh, as he was. Now, think about the church of Laodicea. They're this huge commercial center, right? They're a banking center. They have this tremendous material wealth. They had gold. And yet here's Jesus talking to them about a greater gold, right? A refined gold. Gold, something that's of even greater value and greater wealth. And of course, he's talking about the riches that he brings into a person's life. It's those Ephesians 1 kind of riches. 
where Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and he says in Ephesians 1, verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And then, as you know, in the rest of the chapter, he goes on to list all of those blessings that are freely ours because of Jesus. He reminds us that God has chosen us and adopted us and accepted us and redeemed us, that he has forgiven us, that he has sealed us, that heaven is a sure thing for us. And every one of those things, that is the refined gold. Those are the things that make a person truly rich. Because if a person possesses just one of those things, then that person is wealthier than the per person who owns the whole world and doesn't possess even one of those things. These are priceless. Not raw gold, but refined gold. Refined by Jesus in the fire of his affliction for us. Those are the true riches, and they can only come to us from him. And he says that they need to be, what, bought from him. Now, that sounds a little bit strange, doesn't it? Because they can't be bought with money. These things can't be earned or anything like that. But the idea here is that the Laodiceans or any one of us, that we would buy these heavenly riches from him at the expense of, of our pride and our self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is the currency of heaven. And it's only when we recognize and we confess that deep need, confess our own sort of bankruptcy, then Jesus can fill that need. These people were used to people coming to them all the time, coming to the bank and coming to get gold and coming to get wealth and to access wealth that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. And so what Jesus is saying to them is, hey, all of these things that you supply to people physically, I want to supply those things to you spiritually. To give us those true riches, as well as these, these garments of grace, right? These white garments. The ability to see spiritual things. He wants our eyes anointed with this eye salve. And these are two images which really would have hit home for the Laodiceans because they produced two primary products which they exported from Laodicea to all over the known world. One was this very special kind of a glossy black wool from which they made these special sort of Laodicean fashion garments or whatever it was. The other was this kind of an eye salve. And it was produced there in the medical school that was located in Laodicea in the temple of Asclepius. And this eye salve was said to heal all of the common eye troubles of the Middle East. It was said to strengthen weak eyes. So anybody, of 40, uh, anybody above 40, of course, is flocking to buy this stuff, right? It's going to strengthen weak eyes. It's going to restore diminished vision. And what the Lord is saying, in effect, is what they really needed was not a medicine to restore their failing physical sight, but they needed restored spiritual sight. They needed the illuminating ministry of the Holy Spirit to open their eyes to their real condition. They needed the anointing that the Holy Spirit gives to our eyes so that we can see spiritual things, so that we can see the world the way that we need to see it. They didn't need these beautiful black garments that the world was clamoring for. They needed these white garments that only Jesus can provide. Of course, purity and righteousness and all of these things that are only found in him. So he says, you know, just in the same way that the whole world is coveting these black garments and this eye salve physically, he said, you should have an immeasurably greater desire for that covering and the insight spiritually that only I can provide to you. And I think we see, as we've seen before in every other letter, very quickly, notice the way it all ties back to the way he introduced himself to the church in verse 14, when he said that he is the amen, he's the faithful and true witness, he's the beginning of the creation of God, right? He is the truth, right? 
He is the true and ultimate representation of the Father, and he is preeminent, right? He's the beginning. He is the genesis of all creation. Because what the church of the Laodiceans had done in their materialism and their selfism, they were completely guilty of abandoning the superior for the inferior. Here they were worshiping themselves, and yet they had been created. Here they were worshiping wealth, and yet it was something created. And Jesus is saying to them, look, you've replaced the creator and the heavens of the earth. You've replaced those things with the creation itself, and you've got things completely backward. And that is a fairly significant step down when we start to do that. He's trying to open up their eyes right, to the foolishness of abandoning the worship of him for anything else. And it's this call to repentance right from the heart of the Lord. In verse 19, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Isn't it ironic to consider that the great love that Jesus has is best expressed how? in his rebuke and his correction. I love what one author wrote. He said, it is in fact God's final punishment to leave a man alone. And I don't want us to miss this. This is a critical connection because Jesus clearly states that he rebukes them because he loves them. It's because of his love that he's gonna bring this chastening and this discipline. It's, as it says in Hebrews 12, that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And to me, in many ways, this verse is perhaps actually the most shocking of the whole letter. And I know we think, wow, you know, that whole vomit business, that was pretty shocking. That was big. And yet it's because of the vomit line that makes this so strong and makes it so beautiful because of everything that they were and of everything that they weren't, of everything they had done, all the things they hadn't done, because, you know, all, 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 all of it to the worst church of all the seven churches. Jesus still looks at them and he declares to them, I love you. And it's because I love you that I am telling you these things. Yes, they needed to repent, and yes, they needed to turn back to him, but he loved these people. And he loves them enough to tell them the truth about their condition, and then to breathe this breath of hope into their situation. Because when, when you're personally in that kind of a situation spiritually, and you start out reading this letter, your immediate thought is, well, he's going to smoke me, right? He is going to fry me. And then you realize this, and you realize, wow, he still loves me. I've been so far from him. I've been so lukewarm towards him for so long, but he loves me, and there is still hope that I can turn to him because he's right there waiting for me. And then he gives them this precious assurance in verse 20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. So here Jesus gives to this lukewarm church and to every single individual in the church, he gives them the great invitation. And very dramatically, of course, he pictures himself as standing outside of the church completely. And he's knocking there on the door to be let in. And we have all heard these verses before, right? And so often they're used as a gospel invitation for the unsaved. And that's absolutely a, a fine application. But let's be very clear, church, that Jesus says it here in its original context, in this passage, Jesus is standing outside and knocking on the door, not just of an unbeliever, but he is standing at the door of the heart of each and every lukewarm believer as well. 
This picture applies to the sinner and to the saint in just the same way. That Jesus wants to come into us and he wants to dine with us in the sense of having this deep, intimate relationship with us. When Jesus says dine with him, it was referring to a very specific meal known as the dipnon. It's what we would call probably supper. It was like the main meal of the day when everybody comes and sits and talks for hours because there was now finally the time to do that. It was a meal that talks about fellowship and speaks about a depth of relationship. And he says, if you open the door, I will come in. And when I do, this is what's going to happen. We will start this very deep, intimate, personal relationship with one another. And that's what he's calling them to do. And he's calling them to do it because they were the only ones who could do it. They were the only ones that could open the door. There's a very familiar painting, and in fact, virtually any painting that you see based on this verse, you see that the latch of the door isn't shown. It seems like it's missing. And as the story goes, when questioned, the artist declared that the latch wasn't missing at all, but instead it just isn't visible because it wasn't on the outside, it was only on the inside. Because only we can open the door of our hearts again to Jesus. Because we need to repent of our pride, repent of our self-sufficiency, all of that human wisdom, our apathy, and we need to humble ourselves before him in brokenness. And we need to remember, Jesus is not going to kick down the door and let himself in. As our creator, of course, he would have every right to do that, and yet he doesn't. In his wisdom, the sovereign, omnipotent Jesus has condescended to make us the ones who open the door of our hearts according to our will. But this is the place that Jesus wants us, is right there in that place of intimacy and fellowship with him. Understand, everything that he has said to the Laodicean church up to this point has to be seen in light of his loving desire for fellowship with them, for relationship with them. And now he goes on to say that to the individual who opens that door and rekindles that relationship, now there's this promise of an additional reward. In verse 21, he says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. It's a pretty awesome promise. Does it seem a little bit strange to you that although this is the worst of the seven churches, and yet this is the most glorious of all promises that are made to it, that those who overcame this battle against indifference and self-deception and self-reliance, they would receive a special reward enjoying that place with the enthroned Jesus, ruling with him during the coming millennial reign and even beyond that into eternity. And you think about this eternal promise and it is worth so much more than all of those things that they were striving after in this life. And yet he so graciously offers it so freely. And I love this because I think it reminds us that even the worst of us can instantly repent. We can finally conquer. We can live victoriously. And we can receive such an incredible eternal reward. I think that it shows that we don't need to continue to be Christians who are complacent or who are lukewarm. That even if that is us this morning, that we can change. That we can become one of Jesus' overcomers. Instead of being overcome, by the world around us, we can be an overcomer of those things. And sometimes a person can get to a place where they have been languishing in this lukewarmness for so long that they effectively lose any hope of getting out of it. And yet I think what Jesus is showing us is that he is just on the other side of that door. 
And that all we need to do is to obey his word, open the door, and he will come in and then he'll do the rest. He'll give to me the power of the Holy Spirit to live and to walk in a way that's pleasing to him. And that when we then step out in the power of the Spirit, we discover that it's there, and all of a sudden we walk right out of the doors of the church of Laodicea, and we walk right into the life that God is calling us to live. It's so simple. There is hope for us this morning, every single one of us, no matter where we find ourselves. He says in verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. None of us wants to be right, a member of this church of Laodicea. And yet it's so easy to find ourselves very comfortable and suddenly we realize we are card carrying members of that church. You know, so may God deliver us from that self-reliant, self-deception, from all of the self-ism that I believe was really at the root of the lukewarmness of the Laodiceans. We need to hear what the Spirit says here, not just in this letter, right, but in each of these letters. Because as believers, we can find ourselves in so many of these different situations that are so similar to any number of these churches. And I know that we have taken, taken our time, right, for seven full weeks we have been in these seven letters, but they have been provided to us as this incredible grid for us to really look at our lives and to start to see them the way that Jesus sees them. We can look at our lives and we can ask ourselves, are we Ephesus, right? Are we starting to, to leave that first love for Christ? Are we Smyrna, where we're struggling to, to stand up under persecution? Are we Pergamos, where we've gotten into this kind of an objectionable marriage with the things of the world? Are we Thyatira, where our worship has been corrupted by some sort of a system that's threatening to pull the focus off of Jesus? Are we Sardis? Are we well maintained on the outside, but hiding this inner lack of true spiritual life and power on the inside because we've neglected the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life? Or are we like Laodicea? Have we gotten to this point of being lukewarm and indifferent and complacent kind of ruled by ourselves and resting in all of our great material wealth that we have here in this country. And yet the single answer to all of these seven situations, just like the church at Philadelphia, is to keep his word, right? to hold fast to his word and the teaching of the scriptures. Seven separate times, Jesus calls us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And when we stop listening to the voice of the Spirit and we start listening to all the other voices that are in our heads and that are in the world, that's when we begin to turn away from the truth. Not only they'll keep his word, but like Philadelphia, to not deny his name. To hold fast to and to lift up the person of Jesus Christ because in his name and his alone is the power for salvation and the power for our daily walk. Colossians, it says that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You are complete in him. He is the head of all principality and power. Peter tells us that Jesus, as his divine power, has given to us, read it with me, all things. He's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And it seems overly simple, but we can so easily forget that the answer to all of our questions the answer to all of our struggles and the answer to our deepest hurts and our frustrations, the key to a victorious life is just Jesus, right? The amen, the faithful and true witness, amen? So Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, Lord, and as difficult as this word to the church at Philadelphia is, Lord, we thank you for it. And we pray, Lord, that for any of us who find ourselves right now in that place of the Laodiceans, Lord, we pray that we would take your counsel, Lord, and that we would 
buy from you at the cost of our own pride, Lord, the cost of our own self-sufficiency, we would buy that refined gold, Lord, that we would take advantage of all of those spiritual blessings, Lord, that in our emptiness, that we would ask to be filled up with you. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. We ask you to do that deep work inside of each one of us, Lord, that work that only you can do. And we ask, Lord, that you do it even now. And we ask it, Lord, in the mighty and the matchless and the wonderful name of Jesus.